Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in AP English and we turn in our study of Dante's Inferno now to Canto 18. We are now in Circle 8. We are now in the Mala Bolgia, that is to say, we are in the evil pouches. Okay, now, um, the, this, this Bolgia, bulge, I mean you can see where this word comes from, right? Usually translated as, uh, as pit of evil or pouch of evil or valley of evil. Um, we're going to have here now, we're moving from the incontinent through the violent and now here we are at simple fraud as it's often referred to and we're going to get uh, the bulgia of uh, number one, the panders and the seducers and then number two we're going to get the flatters and we're going to have yeah we're going to have some word pictures here that will uh, be very very disgusting. We got 13 cantos now that will be devoted to this uh, um, this uh, 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 malabolge, this idea of um, we've got we've got a large area and then we got pits within pits, uh, you know, something like rooms within rooms or you know that kind of thing. Okay, um, and this really is the heart of Inferno in terms of. Uh, let me just give you a spoiler alert or heads up or whatever. A lot of my students will say this is the stuff that gives them nightmares at night when they start reading this stuff because. Some of the images are just really grotesque. I mean, we're going to have one here that, i got to be honest, is probably as disturbing and as disgusting an image as you're going to see in literature, and yet we're going to have to see it, all right? So let's get ready. You know, if you haven't been following our stuff here, LearnStrong.net, the AP folder, I very much recommend that you do it. I'm working off of the assumption that you've been working starting with the Iliad all the way up through the Aeneid and then finally up through St. Augustine's Confessions. Let's do a real quick review as we've done in all of our previous uh, lectures and of course our previous um, uh, 17 lectures of the different cantos. 1 through 17, again we said it in our last lecture, halfway through now, the inferno itself. That, um, let's review really quickly. Canto 1, we are uh, in the uh, early mornings of April the 7th of 1300, Good Friday. Dante the Pilgrim is 35 years old and he's lost in a dark wood and he needs Virgil's help because he can't get up the mountain of God because the leopard, the lion, and the wolf won't allow it. Canto 2, the invocation of the muse, and then Virgil tells him that Beatrice is the one who sent him and then Dante is ready. Canto 3, we've got the inscription of hell abandoned, hope all ye who enter here, and the uncommitted. Um, Canto 4, we've got limbo circle 1, the unbaptized pagans, Homer and uh, Virgil himself and Aristotle are there. We then will have Cantos 5, 6, and 7, circles 2, 3, 4, and 5, that will be what we call the incontinent, those who had weak will, we might say. Circle 2, the Jack Lovers, Dido, Francesca and, and Paolo who committed the adultery and then were killed while uh, they were engaged in that act. Um, Canto 6, Circle 3, we've got the gluttons. Chaco makes his prophecies about Florence and the final judgment. Canto 7, we've got Circle 4, the prodigals and the avaricious, those who couldn't, couldn't hold on to a dime and those who never let go of a dime. And they're pushing these rocks around, unable to communicate with each other. And then in Circle 5, we have Styx, the wrathful and the sullen, and they also have difficulty speaking. We then move into Canto 8 with Philegius and the trip on the river Styx, or the marsh Styx. Felipe Argente is there. For the first time, Dante will treat a, a prisoner kind of not so well. And then we come to the city of Satan, the city of Dis. But we're not allowed inside. Canto 9, the gates of Dis are opened by an angel, a disdainful angel who's come, and he's not pleased that he's had to come down and do this project. And then into Dis they go. This is now circle six, the circle of heretics, right? Not the non-believers, but the unbelievers, right? Those who, um, the, those who refused to believe. They knew what they should believe, but they didn't believe, as opposed to the uncommitted, right? Into, um, into now Canto, Canto 10, Dante's conversation with Farinata and Cavalcante, very important conversation politically as well as linguistically. Canto 11, Virgil will give us a map of the rest of hell. Um, this Malvogie is, is going to be mentioned uh, as it's coming, and now we're finally here, okay? And of course, all this predicated on Dante's understanding of Aristotle and Aristotelian physics. We then will work with the violence starting in Canto 12. We have Circle 7, and we'll have three rings or rounds of Circle 7. Circle 7, Canto 12. Circle 7, Round 1, we have the Minotaur, the Centaurs, we have the Violin against Neighbors, the Philagian, and the River of Blood. Canto 13, Circle 7, Round 2, we have the Violin against Self. These are the suicides and the talking trees. It's a disturbing canto, as we said. Canto 14, we have Circle 7, Ring 3, the Violin against God. These are the blasphemous 
and Cepheus is here, that, um, that giant who refuses to ever admit that he was defeated, very Promethean-like. We're going to make an observation about that kind of an individual when we get now to Canto 18 here in a bit. Canto 15, we've got Circle 7, Ring 3, the violin against nature. These are the Sodomites, although very, they're, they're never actually named as such. And uh, Brut, uh, Brutino Latini, we made our observations in our conversations about Canto 15 and Canto 16. The, the, the paradoxical treatment that these homosexuals are given and the ways, of course, in which the Church of Dante's day would define sexual acts that did not lead to procreation as unnatural acts, of course, we, we, we made observations about the ways in which often these ideas of what constitutes a sin begin to alter as we move closer and closer to our own postmodern post day. Canto 16, Circle 7, again, Ring 3. Three uh, Florentines who are accused of, uh, or must have been accused of sodomy, um, will dance in a ring around Dante. Dante, again, showing tremendous respect, however. In Canto 17, um, we will uh, there finish our circle of the violence, of the area of the violent, and circle seven, ring three, the violent against art, and here it's the users, and, uh, and then we have Gerion's uh, ride, the ride on Gerion's back, that takes them out of that, and then into uh, where we are now, and the Malbolge, the area of simple fraud. Now again, the hope is that you're working with this material on your own and then coming to me for help and guidance in your reading of this material. Our learning theory is always looking to connect new information to old information in meaningful ways. We do that in our reading annotative theory by answering the guiding questions. What does the text say? What does the text mean? 2A, messages, themes 2B. We're concentrating at the rhetorical level on symbolism and irony as well as Dante as poet as politician and as philosopher. And then finally at level three we ask, how can I relate to this information in some meaningful way? 3A, um, relating it to the text that we've studied already in AP and elsewhere, text we know. And then finally 3B, how can I relate this information to myself personally? Let's do a real quick brief summary of Canto 18 before we read it. They are in the 10 pit, the ten pits or bulges of the uh, Malabolge. And um, they meet the panders, we're going to get an interesting story from a guy named Venedico Cacasimonis, which is a really interesting uh, story. And then we're going to meet the seducers. Here we're going to have an interesting hero. Jason of the Argonauts is going to end up here. Why? Because, well, you know, you'll remember this from our study in Edith Hamilton's mythology, right? Hippasali, um, um, he, he, he seduces her and leaves her. And then, of course, Medea, he seduced her and left her as well. Jason gets what Jason deserves in Dante's Inferno. And finally, we're going to meet the flatterers, and we're going to have a couple of uh, people here that we will meet, and uh, we're, we're going to get to what happens to these poor flatterers. It's a pretty disgusting thing. And from here on out, you will never use the term BS or again when you talk about somebody that's telling you a non-truth. Um, again, the same way, trust me. All right, let's go ahead and get to this thing, and, uh, and we'll read it, and then you can enjoy or be worried by some of the information that we've got here in Canto 18. Let's read together. There is a place called Malabolge in hell. Dante, by the way, invented this word, which literally, as we said, means evil pouches, right? Malabolge. Constructed wholly of iron-colored stones, including the circumferential wall, right in the center of the, ma of the malign field, yawns a wide, deep pit. Concerning its design, I shall say more in time. So we're going to hear more about this, but now he's going to give us a description of Malabolge really quickly. A belt remains between the base of that high wall of stone and the central pit, a circular band divided in 10 concentric valleys. So we're gonna have 10 subsets or 10 bulges or 10 pits or whatever you wanna call it. Pouches is often gonna be the translation that will be used. 10 concentric valleys as in a plan where guardian moats successfully are graded around the castle's wall. In such a place, a series of small bridges would be provided out from the fortress threshold and across to the last bank. Just so, from the rock wall's foot ran spoke-wise ridges crossing over each foss and its embankment extending to the pit that gathers them and cuts them off. This will be convenient obviously for Dante the pilgrim and for Virgil to be able to look down into the pit and to be able to see certain individuals. This place was where we found ourselves when we alit from Gerion's back. The poet leading us held to the left and I came on behind. To my right side I saw new tortures, new woes, New tormentors, uh, there's no question, we're going to see a whole lot of new tragedy here. With whom the first ditch teemed, 
down at its bottom were naked sinners. And now we're going to see a lot more of this. It's almost as if the deeper we go into hell, the more clearly the bodies seem to be a part of the torture. So we're going to, the bodies will be there and they will be naked. Okay. The crowd massed on our side of the center paced the ground headed towards us, while those on the other side walked facing as we did, but with a greater pace. Um, those of you that ever heard that term, highway to hell, this, it's like an interstate now, where you've got some that are walking towards Dante and, and uh, the Pilgrim and Virgil, and some that are walking away, so all they can see is their back. Now, where did that word picture like this come from? Well, we're told, Dante will tell us, we come back to his favorite friend, no pun intended, Boniface VIII, the Pope, and, and in 1300, Boniface decided that he would call the church's first jubilee and would give ablution to anyone who showed up and then prayed there. Now, there was a whole lot of skeptics, Dante being one of them, that what Boniface was really trying to do, Boniface VIII, was to try and get a whole lot of people into Rome so there could be a whole lot of money made because of the selling of indulgences and the like. It will be here now that the word picture will come as when the Romans, because of the multitude gathered for the Jubilee, had pilgrims cross the bridge with one side kept for all those bound towards St. Peter's facing the castle, while those headed toward the mount were all assigned the other side. In other words, they literally had to do this thing where some were going in to St. Peter's and some were coming out, so they had to have it organized. Along the dismal rock in both directions, I saw demons horned and carrying large scourges, and they struck savagely from behind. Above it was in the in, in inferno. It was the centaurs, for example, shooting arrows. Now we've actually got demons. The demons of hell then will legitimately start in circle eight, and, uh, and, and we're going to see a, a whole lot of this kind of thing, right? Uh, at the first blow, and by the way, this notion of the demons that are mentioned here for the first time, uh, it's interesting how we, they're, not mentioned, they're not called fallen angels. We saw them in the city of Dis. So who are these demons? And, and Dante doesn't really get into a lot of detail as to where these come from. In Milton's Paradise Lost, as we study later, these demons will, of course, be the fallen angels of, uh, that were thrown out of heaven after their defeat. Here it's just called the demons. And because Dante is a Christian and writing, of course, to Christians, the assumption is everybody knows who and what a demon is. Of course, it's always fascinating to actually ask about demons and to, for example, pick up a biblical text and read it in its entirety and ask, do we ever have in the Bible an example of this kind of thing where you have a demon that is actually persecuting another person in this way? You can have demon possession. Probably not the same thing, though, as what Dante's going to describe here. Watch this. We saw demons, or I saw demons, horned and carrying large scourges, and they struck savagely from behind. Ah, at the first blow, how terribly... They force them to be quick, lifting their heels. By the way, they have to be made to walk. These individuals don't want to walk, but they're forced to. Notice the opposite. The, we, we saw the, the sodomites, the, the users, and the, and, and the blasphemers. They were in different configurations, but you'll remember the sodomites were unwilling or unable or not wanting to ever stop, right? Because they would get their hundred-year punishment and all of that. None waited to undergo the second or the third scourging from the demon, in other words. As I walked on, one of the wretches looking from below met my eyes. Instantly I said, I've seen this fellow before, and paused to make him out. And again, let's just point out political Dante. If you're a Florentine living uh, uh, and alive when you're, re you're living in Florence, and you know that Dante knew you, when you, when you read a, a, a line like this, you're, you're going, oh no, will I be the next one mentioned, right? And I know, uh, uh, I, I, I've seen this fellow before. Dante put everybody on alert earlier in Inferno. Just remember, you could be, I mean, if, uh, if Chaco is going to be mentioned, right, just the town, the town glutton, then obviously Florentines are going to be worried about who gets mentioned next. I've seen this fellow before, line 41, and pause to make him out. And my kind leader gave me leave to turn a short way back. That tortured soul thought to hide himself by lowering his face, but that did a little good. By the way, notice, in the early parts of hell, you have more sinners who are being punished, who seem to want to have conversations. And in fact, the, remember, the sodomites, those homosexuals in that circle, they literally run up to Dante and they dance around Dante. And they want to be commented to. And, and in fact, they want to be remembered. Here, starting in Circle 8, we'll have fewer and fewer people who actually want to in any way be remembered. They are, if you will, ashamed. We do not have that sense of shame in Circle 7 that we have here now in Circle 8. 
The tortured spirit thought to hide himself by lowering his face, but that did a little good, and I cried out, You, looking at the ground there, surely if those features you wear are not false, you are named Venedico Cacamaniso. Say, what is it that brings you sauces of such a pung or kind? By the way, this uh, individual was a Guelph of, uh, he was uh, from Bologna, and um, he obviously is very, very unhappy and unwilling to have this conversation, and he to me. I tell it unwillingly, he says, but your plain speech compels me. But back to speech again. In other words, you are a Tuscan, you are, uh, you, you're Italian, I, I, will, I will speak to you. Your plain speech compels me, bringing to my memories of the former world. In other words, hearing you talk reminds me of when I was alive. It was I who brought, and now we're going to get this story, his sister, um, um, Gio Sodello, um, and, and he sells his sister to the Marchese. Um, and this is, of course, the circle of what we call panders or pimps. He's going to get called a pimp, actually. It was I who brought Gio Savelia to do the will of the Marchese. However, it may be that the obscure, obscene history is told. But still, he says, I'm not the only Bellonese here crying in torment. In truth, the place is so full, there are fewer tongues alive up there between Savenia and Reno, the two, the two rivers uh, uh, of Bologna. How uh, being taught how to say Scipio or yes, and it, and if what you desire is evidence to confirm it, just give some thought to our avaricious nature. So now we get a critique of the Bellonese, and here notice he says, "There's more of us here than there are up there." The earlier line from Inferno, "I had not thought death had done so many," comes back to mind, right? And as he spoke, a demon came and lashed him crying out. So again, we've got these demons that are they're able to speak, right? Get moving, pimp. This is no place to look for women to sell. And the fact that he mentions women to sell all of a sudden kind of makes us think, you know, kind of come to think of it, hell is a place to this point. People predominantly buy males, not females, which is what made Francesca and the conversation so interesting because Paolo just stood there silently weeping and it was Francesca that talked. But after Francesca, have we met any women, think about this, who, is who have especially been allowed to even speak or, or have any, even referencing that they are women. It is predominantly a male world in Inferno. And notice he says, we don't have any women down here for you to pimp, so go get going. Rejoining my escort, so that's it for the panders. I came with him to where a ridge of rock jutted from the bank. We climbed it without much effort, and turning right along its craggy bridge, left that eternal circling. We reached the part, now we're going to get to the seducers, where a space yawning underneath the ridge gives passage to the scourge. And there, he said, stop. This is interesting, the times that Virgil will tell Dante the Pilgrim to stop. Let the sight of this other great assemblage of ill-begotten souls impress you. They strode the way you did, so you could not see their faces because all you saw were their backs. In other words, certain groups of them are walking just like they're walking in the direction they're walking. Stop, look back, you'll get to see somebody's face. And, and we're told, from the old bridge, we look down at the crowd filing towards us, also driven by lashes. The kind guide said, this is interesting, the kind, right, kind, in the middle of all of this, without my questioning, see where that great one sheds as he advances, no tears for pain, how much the look of a king he still keeps? He is Jason. Now this is Jason of the Jason of the Argonauts, Jason. He is Jason who took the ram of Clochis by courage and canning reckoning. Of course, you know this story because of our study of Edith Hamilton's mythology. Jason is one of those. Notice, he does not, go back to it again, he has the look of a king. He, he, he has no tears for his pain. Think about this. This is interesting. Dante seems to like, Dante the poet, seems to like these Promethean-like characters. Earlier in our play, it was Capanus. Here it's Jason. Later it will be Ulysses. These types of characters that, even though they're in hell, they hold a certain kind of, notice all three of them are mythic characters from the ancient tradition of, of, Greek, of greco roman myth, right? And they are tough, strong people. Now it's Jason. Took the ram of Clochis by courage and cunning and canning reckoning. He passed the Isle of Lemnos after the time when its bold, pitiless women killed every male. You know that story where they rounded up all the men and killed all of them. But you'll remember that Hippolyte, uh, you'll remember, 
uh, Hypsipyle saved her father through cunning. Hypsipyle, you'll remember in our story, was also herself kind of cunning, kind of a seductress of a type, right? When its bow pitiless women killed every male, his deceitful gifts and fair words overcame the young Hypsipyle right there, who'd had the skill to deceive the rest. She got her father out. He, Jason, left her great with child, forlorn, and such guilt brings him torment in hell, avenging Medea as well. You'll remember in the story that Jason, after he messes up one woman's life, he messes up Medea's life as well. With him are sealed all those who cheat such ways. Uh, now, now, here we have to pause. And we have to say, as we often say in 303, seriously. What do you mean seriously? Well, think about it. Um, granted, Jason is here because he jacked up Medea. All men who did this to women, this is where they come. Really? Because the last time I checked, Virgil's own hero Aeneas is in limbo. Dido, of course, is in that area of the adulterers, but not, but not Virgil's Aeneas, Aeneas. And here, notice, anybody that jacked up a woman like this, seduced her and then left her, abandoned her. By the way, do you remember in the Aeneid? It was Dido's observation that I wish at least I was with child so I could have something. Well, maybe that's why he doesn't end up here, because he never actually got her pregnant, and therefore he didn't leave both wife and child. Wait, he wasn't actually her husband. Well, in her eyes, we won't get into it. We did it already, remember, with Virgil's Aeneid. We now reach the place, right? Um, uh, um, we now reach the place. Uh, it, by the way, Virgil finishes by saying, all those who cheat such ways, let this suffice for the first valley in knowledge of those who held between his jaws. We had now reached the place at which the narrow pathway cuts across the second bank. And by the way, this thing about between its jaws is interesting because these bulges or these pouches are almost like open mouths. You can kind of think of them that way. And they're swallowing up the centers.